So welcome everyone, uh, those who joined us now and those who were here already. Uh, my name is uh, Limor Chen, and I'm the coordinator of the Israeli Community for Human Animal Studies. I'll be chairing this talk and the following session. We are grateful to have with us Professor Laurie Grun for the keynote talk of the day, Why Ecofeminism Now? Laurie Grun is the William Griffin Professor of Philosophy at Wesleyan University. She is also a professor of feminist, gender, and sexuality studies, science and society, and coordinator of Wesleyan Animal Studies. She is the author and editor of over a dozen books. Since I cannot recount here all of her publications during the years, I will refer to her most recent ones. Animal Crisis, co-authored with Alice Prairie and published by Polity this year, asks us to reimagine our relationships with non-human animals. It offers the realization that animal liberation and human emancipation are interrelated and that one can't be liberated without the other. Another book published this year by Cambridge is Carceral Logics, co-edited with Justin Marceau, and can be accessed online for free. The book focuses on connections and intersections between several issues related to non-human animals, crime, and, and punishment. This year also saw the publication of the second edition of Ecofeminism, Feminist Intersections with Other Animals and the Earth, which was co-edited with Carol Adams uh, by Bloomsbury. This book brings a fresh perspective to ecofeminism through the work of various scholars and activists and addresses how speciesism is linked to perceptions and expressions of sexism, heteronormativity, racism, colonialism, and ableism. Gruen's work has influenced the work of many. It lies in the, at the intersection of ethical and political theory and practice with a particular focus on issues that impact those often overlooked in traditional ethical investigations, such as women, people of color, incarcerated people, and non-human animals. You're all welcome to write down questions and thoughts in the chat box during our talk, and we will attend to them in the discussion. It's with great pleasure I turn to Lori now for her talk, Why Ecofeminism Now? Thanks so much for having me. Um, it's so great to be speaking at um, a conference where the personal and the political are in the subtitle of the conference, of course, early feminists, and I'll talk very briefly about some of the early ecofeminists, but early feminists um, were very clear that the personal is always political. Um, and that's, I think, a central tenet also of ecofeminism. I was, um, so thank you again for having me and for the kind introduction. Um, I was told to sort of speak um, for about 20 to 30 minutes, which is hard for me. So I'm going to probably sort of keep try to keep things fairly tight so that we can have a longer discussion. Um, I will not be trying to at this stage, I'm not going to try to explain some of the misconceptions about ecofeminism, but I really do welcome that conversation after I give you a little bit of a discussion about why ecofeminism now. So let me just start quickly with a brief description and history of ecofeminism. Ecofeminism is a political and intellectual movement, you, you could say. It's grounded in the belief that there are conceptual and structural linkages, links between the ongoing devastation of nature and the subjugation of women, other gender minorities, the poor, colonized, racialized, and other um, marginalized people, as well as non-human animals. And I'm gonna say a little bit in a minute about the ways in which um, these things might come apart, but that's the, I think, a, a broad way of understanding ecofeminism. Um, the basic idea of ecofeminism is that the exploitation and subordination of these various um, groups of others can't be taken apart. And we, if, so the, the idea is that if we can't, if we focus only on women or only on animals, um, that we will not adequately or effectively right the various wrongs that are impacting so many others. And so ecofeminists argue that we must contest them together. They're structurally linked. 
Um, and by structurally, I don't mean what other people tend to mean or some people tend to mean that there are these structures that exist, that there are institutions that exist. Um, but no, this is more conceptual, ontological, and it basically is suggesting that there are foundational, I'll say very briefly what I mean by this in a moment, but there are foundational links. And so that's part of the reason you can't separate out the exploitation of women, the exploitation of colonized or racialized others, and the exploitation and violence that we do to non-human animals. And when I say that we need to take them together, um, importantly, I'm not saying that we always have to talk about all of these things at the same time, but what I do think is important to think about when we're talking from an ecofeminist lens or through an ecofeminist lens is that we need to recognize that there are different people that are and different animals that are differently impacted by various things. So we can't really talk about the impacts, for example, of climate change. They're going to be very different for different communities. We can't talk about the impacts of a certain kind of extrapolation of um, certain kinds of resources that are going to disproportionately impact others. So the idea is that not that we have to constantly bring up racism and sexism and ableism and colonialism, you know, all of these horrors and speciesism. We don't have to always bring them up in everything we do, but we, they always have to be in our minds when we're speaking about these quote unquote general crises and problems that we're facing. So that's what I mean by that. The label of ecofeminism was first uh, used in the 1970s. Everybody um, always attributes this to a French theorist named Francois de Bon, but um, Rosemary Radcliffe Ruther, uh, American theologian who just passed away last, last month, is another one of these forerunners of ecofeminist ideas. Basically, what the early um, ecofeminists were doing was looking at the women's movement at the time in the 70s and looking at environmental movements and noticing that there was a lot of connection and overlap. And that was kind of the first step towards a kind of ecofeminism that gives sort of theoretical expression, if you will, to a variety of different kinds of activists. Um, activities, women, for example, uniting with workers to protect children who might be exploited in labor, um, women in India, uh, the Chipko movement, saving trees, um, and other forms of protest and action throughout um, the same number, interestingly, of decades um, that animal ethics has actually been around. Ecofeminism and animal ethics are about the same age, um, if you think of, um, of that. Um, although obviously people were making connections about ethical and unethical use of animals, as well as the, the destruction of the environment and, and women's um, subordination for before the 1970s. But this is when it really got named. And so one of the important insights of ecofeminism is that social, political, and economic mechanisms that are central or internal, if you will, necessary for racial capitalism basically can explain the linked disdain for nature, the subjugation of women and members of oppressed groups as well as animals. So ecofeminists respond to environmental destruction and these interconnected oppressions by calling for a restructuring of our relationships, our relationships with other animals, our relationships with the rest of nature, and of course, our relationships with each other. So that's a very brief um, description of what ecofeminism is. What I'd like to now talk about are three strands or streams or versions or commitments of ecofeminism. Sometimes they're called strands, sometimes they're called um, streams, but I, I think they're actually commitments. Um, and I do want to say that ecofeminism is a very diverse um, umbrella term. And so not all of the ecofeminists or not all of the people who identify as ecofeminists will have these commitments or operate with these commitments. So these are sort of commitments that um, I share, 
with others who are, have been um, centrally active in the development of ecofeminist theory and practice. Um, so the first, the first strand um, that I wanna mention is this idea to um, what we could think of or what's been called by the late Karen Warren. It's, it's important, I just wanna honor both Rosemary Radcliffe Ruther who most recently passed, but also um, early foremothers of ecofeminism, Karen Moran, um, who passed away in the last few years, and of course, Val Plumwood, a very important um, ecofeminist philosopher who's also um, passed away, but these were very important foremothers of, of ecofeminist movement. Um, okay, so one of the strands of ecofeminism that I wanted to highlight is this uh, critique of what Karen Moran called value dualisms or Another way of thinking about that is as conceptual binaries, or more recently, I've been following uh, uh, important animal um, theorist who also works on race issues, Claire Jean Kim, who calls these notions taxonomies of power. So what am I talking about when I'm talking about these ideas? So we all are familiar with sort of um, this notion that nature is opposed to culture or culture is opposed to nature. And there's a binary that's been very criticized over the last couple of decades between there's men on the one hand and women on the other. Um, and then there's also ideas of human on the one hand and animal on the other. These are the kind of value binaries that are at issue when we're thinking about an ecofeminist analysis. These binaries put, and their value binaries, or you could think of them as hierarchies really, they put certain people, certain humans on top of other humans, on top of other humans, on top of all other animals. And even within animals, there can be a kind of value distinction that's often made. You might've heard recently um, about the case of the non-humans rights project that brought happy, a case of happy an elephant to the courts to try to name happy a person. And part of the argument for making happy a person is that she's smart, she's autonomous, she's got all the capacities of the human beings at the top of the hierarchy. And that's going to mean that some beings like fish, octopus, maybe other, other animals are not going to be in that top of the hierarchy. So I'm not going to be, I don't have time today to get into some of my critiques of these hierarchies, but one of the central issues that's important for ecofeminist thinking is that these hierarchies um, are um, damaging. They're structurally important for the maintenance of a system that keeps particular others at the top and subordinates the rest of us. So part of what ecofeminists are interested in doing is not just analyzing these taxonomies of power or these value binaries or these value dualisms, these hierarchies, but actually so to try to make them visible to us so that we can reimagine what more just and egalitarian and fair um, relationships might be like. Um, one of the central sort of nodes, if you will, in these binaries is the inflated role that reason has played. So another binary that's familiar is between reason and emotion. Um, and reason plays a very specific kind of role, an elevated role in law, in policy, in social arrangements more broadly. And it's also played a very important role in animal ethics and animal activism too. Even though the philosopher Jeremy Bentham said, the question is not, can they talk or can they reason, but can they suffer? And suffering is an important feature of animal ethics. One of the central problems is that reason still becomes this really elevated capacity that we have to show that other animals have. Um, and I believe that this is a false opposition and many ecofeminists, including Val Plumwood, have argued that that conception of reason is problematic. Um, I talk about this in my work on entangled empathy, but essentially the idea is that when we have that conception of reason, what, we're en what we end up doing is truncating this process of engagement that always involves also affect or emotion. And so what, one of the things that ecofeminists are very keen to do is not to reject reason, that's not 
uh, not what's happening in this, um, in the ecofeminist um, sort of project, but rather to reconceptualize and re-envision reason as a, it works together with emotion so that it provides a tool for discerning the range of problems that we confront. Um, so it's, it's a, if you can think about it, we've, we've, or we, um, we is a question, an issue that we'd have to challenge, but traditionally what's happened is reason gets elevated above emotion and emotion gets cut off from reason. By cutting reason and emotion off, by making them into a binary, we end up losing a lot of the value that we can gain by including and recognizing that our discernment of moral problems and our ability to solve those moral problems fundamentally depend on us bringing reason and emotion together, that we need to think about reason and emotion together to discern um, and develop our sensitivities to the moral problems that we face, the ethical problems that we face. In addition, reason alone is not going to motivate any action. We need to have both uh, the process of reason and emotion so that we can accurately discern the problems that are before us and act to change them. Um, and so part of um, what I'll mention in a moment is that part of what we need to discern is the value of the lives of other animals. And one of the difficulties of recognizing and appreciating and discerning this value is that um, when we just use reason, we're not using our full capacity to understand, let's call them non-linguistic others, um, others that aren't going to um, be able to tell us what might be on their mind. Um, so basically this idea of putting together reason and emotion that ecofeminists, um, it's just one of the binaries that ecofeminists are concerned about, but one of the um, main reasons to take reason and emotion and put them back together is that that's, by putting eco, by putting emotion and reason back together, we're gonna be able to develop our moral perception and to attune our sensitivities and our sensibilities to the more than human world. So that's a really central strand of um, ecofeminism. It focuses on these value dualisms and these hierarchies, and then does the kind of work that I just briefly described to try to unpack the problems of dividing these things up and, and recognize how we might re-envision um, what, what had been divided in these value dualisms or in these binaries. So that's one strand. Um, I wanna talk about another strand of ecofeminism. And this is a, a little bit of a harder strand for some people, but I think it's super important. Um, and it is that one that um, has been very central in the work of ecofeminist Carol, Carolyn Merchant, for example, but Ariel Sella and other ecofeminists, myself and Alice Crary included in our new book, Animal Crisis, um, have, we want to talk about the trouble with racial capitalist modes of social organization and reproduction. And there are other newer ecofeminists have, who have really taken up this mantle. Um, but the idea here is that this strand identifies the links between the use of animals and nature as free resources for markets um, with the denigration of women, indigenous and enslaved people who are made to do reproductive care and subsistence work in capitalist economies. And so part of what the critique here is, is that the devastation of nature and the subjugation of women are not coincidental. These are not things that are just by accident happening at the same time. They're actually necessary parts of the working of capitalism. Um, and if you go back to the original critique of capitalism in Marx's work, there, the women, nature, animals, indigenous people, enslaved people are what you could call the sources of primitive, primitive accumulation. So the idea of primitive accumulation for Marx was one that highlights the way that the markets, I mean, I'm oversimplifying here, but the markets depend on various goods 
that can be accumulated prior to the existence of the market, right? So here, one way to think about it um, is to think, uh, I mean, sort of in some imagined world prior to the one we're now living in, where there's free space, people might go out and enclose the space. They didn't have to buy the land, they just had to work the land in order for the land to become theirs. And once they worked the land and enclosed the land, they then became, got title to the land and then the land was theirs. And then they could start selling whatever it was on in markets, what they grew on the land or what they grazed on the land or what they raised on the land. And the workers and the creatures that created the initial um, conditions for this market exchange are free resources. And that's the, the notion of primitive accumulation. Again, very quick, but I wanted to just put that out there because it's an important way of thinking about what, how did it come to be that women are subordinate to men? How did it come to be that colonized and racialized others are subordinate to colonizers and white people? How did it come to be that animals are less valuable than humans? Part of the explanation that certain strand of ecofeminists argue is that it's part and parcel of the capitalist system to take these these subordinated others and make them into free resources. Now there's a debate um, amongst sort of Marxist economists, Marxist theorists, and also ecofeminists about whether or not this isn't a one, this was a one-time event. The way I just described it, it sounded like a one-time event, you enclose the land and, and that's that. Um, but some ecofeminists maintain that it's a persistent part of capitalism and it's an ongoing, it's the ongoing expropriation from the earth and indigenous communities and animals that allow for the um, profits of capital to um, continue to accumulate. And part of the part, part of the critique from ecofeminists is that um, this is also happening in the realm of the what go back to the personal and political, what the divide between the personal and the political that's central to capitalist economies as well. So in the reproductive sphere, in the caring sphere, in the domestic sphere, and we know about this, women's labor is not um, valued, it's not um, part of what's on the market. And so in this way, um, there is a variety of forms of labor um, that's exploited, a variety of lives, animal lives, non-human animal lives that are exploited and taken. And so the upshot of this idea is that women's social subjugation and the destruction of nature and animals are products of this interlocking economic capitalist social formation. So part of what um, is important to see is that respecting animals requires abandoning the notion that they are mere resources and recognizing and respecting their value. And ecofeminists have argued against the ways that we can call it the logic of fungibility that's so central to capitalism that requires some and maybe most life be reduced to use value and destroyed that that logic of fungibility be undone. Um, and so this is a really um, important analysis that ecofeminists have brought to bear on the connections between eco, um, eco terror, or eco destruction and capitalism and the further exploitation of the labor of women and marginalized others. So that's, that's the second strand that I wanted to highlight. The third strand that I wanna highlight, and this is something that um, Carol, Carol J. Adams and I um, talk about in our introductory book, in our introductory chapter to our our second edition. If anybody's interested in the hist a deeper history of ecofeminism in the first edition of ecofeminism, Carol and I wrote um, a more historically based um, discussion, which we called ground ecofeminist groundwork. Um, in the current um, volume, we wrote a lengthy um, article or chapter in which we we talk a, a lot about some of these social formations that I'm talking about um, today. But one of the central ideas um, 
another strand of ecofeminism. And again, this isn't one that all ecofeminists embrace. So I want to just be very clear. Ecofeminism, like the term feminism, is a broad umbrella term. And there are a variety of different ways that people are engaged in um, ecofeminism. But one way that um, Carol and I um, are connected in thinking about ecofeminism is that it is um, a central strand is that we embrace an ethic of care. Um, and an ecofeminist ethic of care is um, different than some other ethics of care that are in, um, in feminist um, spaces. But our basic idea is that care ethics is fundamentally about reimagining our relationships to one another. Many people think that care ethics in the, its confusion about this is that it is a kind of personal and not political um, notion. But actually the way that we conceptualize uh, care is that it is personal and political because the personal is political. Um, but also we think about care as being a radical act, not just of love, but of resistance. And so in that sense, it's fundamentally political. Care-centered strategies of resistance can be pursued both within our personal relationships and are, but also within the political sphere. So how does it work in the political sphere? I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus more on that since we understand um, a little bit more about our, how care works, even when it's undervalued and exploited, um, we understand how care works in the personal realm more, more readily. So one of the ways that care has worked in um, the political sphere is through building community. And part of the way that that community is built, it can be through mutual aid. And we saw a lot of that during the, during the pandemic where people came together to help others, um, not looking to the state necessarily, um, but looking to your neighbors and looking to your community for care and attention. Another way is to create communal spaces, communal gardens. This has become really central in communities of color, poor black communities in the United States where um, community gardening has become a very central part, not just of building a caring connected community, but also of allowing for the development of food sovereignty, which is a whole nother political um, avenue of care. Also sharing resources and localized decision-making um, and just the notion of trying to thrive um, together. I, I was going to bring, and I, I forgot to bring to my computer from my library, um, there's a new, uh, it's called the Care Manifesto um, and it was put together, um, it came out last year, um, Verso Books um, by the Care Collective, a British group. Um, and it, it identifies various ways that care can operate, both in, in our relationships with the state, with the economy, but also in our communities. Um, now, I also just want to end, I'm coming, getting close to the end because I know I need to, I want us to have a conversation, but I did want um, to also mention that animals are a central feature of caring communities um, and active members, they can be active members um, in these collectives, and we see this most pointedly um, in sanctuary. And sanctuary work um, around the world is another place where we can start to think about multi-species community ecofeminist ethics of care. So creating community, um, and I'm going to just try to end here, creating community and caring for those in it um, can also be conceived as what Audre Lorde called a uh, revolutionary form of self-care. And she described self-care as a kind of warfare. Um, since finding ways to exist in the world um, that wants to destroy us or diminish us um, and those in our communities, even our multi-species communities is a radical act. Um, so let me just end by talking very, very quickly um, about why we need ecofeminism now. So in Alice and my new book, this one that I showed you, um, that we suggest that ecofeminism is what we call a critical animal theory of our time. And it basically is important now because it helps us to see connections, it helps us to forge solidarity, and it helps us to build new forms of political consciousness. 
that attune us to, as I've said, the distortions of power that have harmed vulnerable people, that have destroyed non-human animals, both domestic animals and wild animals, and the very planet that we call home. We're at a political and ecological crisis point, and we need to radically rethink our relationships with each other and the more than human world, and then act boldly to change course. Ecofeminism can help us to analyze the various problems we confront and also guide us in changing course. And we need to change course before it's too late. So let's talk about um, your thoughts about ecofeminism and questions or comments that you might have. Thank you so much, Laurie. It was fascinating. Um, we have um, a few questions I see in the chat and also some raised hands. Um, I saw that Shlomit uh, wrote the first uh, comment in the chat. Shlomit, would you like to unmute and ask the question? Yes, thank you very much. Laurie, thank you very much for uh, being here with us. It's, uh, it's a great honor. Uh, your talk was wonderful, and, and I was wondering because, you know, my students keep asking me all the time what, um, what this thought of um, um, ecofeminism has to offer today in the Anthropocene uh, Mera that is essentially different from other forms of thoughts, other movements that uh, aspire to do the same thing. I mean, so what, what, what do you think that is really unique about the ecofeminist um, way of criticize things or thinking about things? I would really appreciate your thought about it. So I think that one, I, I'm sorry, I, I somehow got kicked out and then got put back on. So I don't know what happened earlier. Um, it could be my connection, sorry about that. Um, but, um, I think I understood your question more generally, which is what is it, why is ecofeminism sort of distinct from some of the other movements that are trying to link these con connections? And I think we get a good answer um, by thinking back to what um, Jeff Sibo said yesterday in his um, talk. It isn't possible from an ecofeminist perspective to think, oh, let a, a, let a, a hundred flowers bloom. Um, we can't have conservatives that want, or racists, <laughs> or others who, or who want to say, um, okay, we're just gonna focus on this right now. This is what we're gonna focus on. What Ecofeminist is doing is digging at the roots. And you think about it in terms of a very organic um, kind of idea. We, we're looking at the roots, both of the political structures, but also the ideological structures that are set up to do exactly what they're doing. So making changes within those structures structures isn't going to get us very far. Now that's not to say it's not gonna improve animal welfare in the short term, or it's not gonna improve human welfare in the short term, but it's going to keep a destructive, violent um, system in place. So ecofeminists are trying to think about how to reorganize our ways of being in the world. And for a long time, 30, 40 years, it seemed like that was just too radical too different, we can't, but we're really at a crisis point and rethinking is a central idea. So I think that's one way I would answer that. Thank you. Um, I see more questions in the chat. Um, I see that uh, Gordon Mead uh, wrote a comment. Gordon, would you like to um, share your thoughts about it? Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, it, it wasn't not a question at all, really. It was just I, I was very interested in the idea of, of how important it is to bring reason and emotion together uh, regarding to any sort of form of discernment in, in any form of work, and especially in my own work. My own writing has become perhaps more overtly political, and the idea of bringing these two streams of, of thinking together the, the, the rational and the emotional is very, very important, I think. So thank, thanks for that, Laurie. Yeah, and I think I also want to say that one of the things that Alice and I talk about in our new book is how important it is to use um, art, poetry, film, 
um, literature um, to sort of heighten our sensitivities and our awareness. Um, and stories of particular animals um, and their, uh, their flourishing and also their demise can also be very moving. And um, in one of our chapters, um, we, each chapter is motivated by a story of a, of a particular animal or group of animals. And in one, we talk about octopus and our octopus's teacher, um, or my octopus's teacher, that film, and the ways that this kind of discernment and attunement brings together reason and emotion to help us revisit and reframe and revision um, what our relationships with others might look like. So thanks for that, Gordon. Um, yeah, Ed? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I wonder about the percent of the eco-feminist um, activists who are engaged in uh, animal rights um, activists and uh, who believe uh, in it. Because I will tell you why I'm a biblical scholar and there is a project, uh, um, the Bible's Earth. It's a kind of eco-feminism and, the, and I, they wrote, uh, one of them, the, the main uh, person there, wrote uh, favorably about fishing and hunting. Hmm. Yeah, um, as I said, there are um, various strands of ecofeminism, and there is a strand of ecofeminism that really doesn't take an non human animals seriously at all. Um, and they are, that's a particular strand that um, goes back uh, probably to the 80s and 90s, in which, um, and this is very similar to feminism, a, a certain kind of liberal feminism, a lean in feminism. We women can do things as well as men can do things, you know, that kind of view. There is that there is a kind of ecofeminism um, that is like that. But as I was talking about, not all ecofeminists are like that, believe that we don't have to attend to animals. And as I said, Carol and I in the volume, um, the old volume, talk a little bit about that tension historically. I believe now that there are more and more um, people who are in the either material feminist world or eco-feminist world who are thinking that you can't exclude non-human animals. I think that in the earlier days that was true, um, but I think that that's, that's very difficult to justify today. I see so many hands, I'm gonna just not talk, I'm talk too much, so I will let other people talk. They came to hear you talk. <laughs> um, on Dean, I see, I, did I say that, that name right? Your name yes. Right? Hi, um, thanks so much, um, Laurie. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate all your work. I've been, I'm my second year into a PhD and been reading a lot of your books. And I'm particularly interested in um, how animals, direct experiences with animals and how animals themselves can transform us as people and our moral frameworks. Um, and I think you wrote about it a little bit in an entangled empathy, but um, yeah, I'm looking at kind of awe inspired experiences with animals and, and different ways that animals can have the, you know, take the power and the agency to create change in us. And I thought I'd hear a little bit more if possible, what you think about that. Yeah, that's such a great question. Thank you so much also for attending to my work. Um, I think it's really, so it's complicated, right? So it's very important for us to be able to recognize animals as agents of change in their own right, quite independent of anything that we might um, think we need to do for them. One of this unfortunate turns of the elevation of reason um, and other kinds of capacities that we humans think are so important in ourselves and the way that that was taken up in the animal movement is that it seems like we have to come in to save animals. Now, of course, to a certain extent, that's true because the industrial systems that are so violent and horrendous do require us to come in and, and save animals. But we also need to recognize that animals aren't simply or only victims, that animals are also agents 
of their own flourishing and agents of their own meaning in their lives. And so one of the central and important things that I think we need to do much more of is tell those stories. And we're not all going to be able to be changed by animals. Maybe we are. I mean, I'm changed by my dogs on a daily basis. So maybe we are. Um, but I'm thinking of my relationship with chimpanzees, for example, which you might have been referring to in Entangled Empathy. And Emma, a chimpanzee, really profoundly changed my life. It was actually, I think of her as sort of a co-creator of my sort of development of the idea of entangled empathy because of what she did, not, you know, what my relationship with her forced me to think about and how um, it really altered me. And then I just thought, well, not all of us are going to have those experiences with chimpanzees. So how is that going to go? But even um, just doing the work that I've been doing recently with um, well, recently for the last decade or so with Vine Sanctuary, which is a, a sanctuary in Vermont in the U.S., which is um, for formerly farmed animals. I mean, I've learned tremendous amounts from peacocks, from cows, from chickens, from ducks. So I think that this is an important way in which, um, and, the, and when I'm saying that cows and chickens and peacocks, I'm thinking not in general terms, but I'm thinking of Rose, the cow, or Rocky, the peacock, um, uh, various ducks, duck, I, I, there's duck, who's a duck, uh, <laughs> but, but a particular duck. And so one of the ideas is that we need to be attending to particular animals to try to understand and uh, uh, discern what's up for them. I think too often within the animal movement, we speak in very broad, broad strokes about cows or about chimpanzees. Um, chimpanzees are really different, just as different as we are. And so again, one of the things that I had alluded to at the very beginning is that we, we have to pay attention to our differences and the differences between um, us and other animals, but also the differences between other animals themselves. And I think that's a really hard thing to do, um, but I think it's absolutely important to make sure that um, our actions are guided by um, let's just put it like this, the hopes and dreams of other animals. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Clara? Hi, um, thank you so much for a wonderful talk um, and such interesting work. I, I have the question, you mentioned sort of capitalism and the commodification of you know of 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 um, women and other um, groups sort of oppressed groups and and animals as a become primary resources resources that provide other labor or, or or sort of goods in some way and i'm wondering i'm thinking of the the when human animal relationships were altered by um agriculture like eight, 10,000 years ago. And so I'm wondering whether capitalism in a sense could be dated back to that time, you know, in a very in, initial, uh, we might call pro primitive form, but where the, you know, the, basically the seeds of, of what it means actually capitalism is about whether it started then when, you know, we moved from a hunter gatherers sort of, type of society to agriculture one because that's when you know humans started to sort of grab the land and and close the animals and and all do all that but that the question that that raises for me is how fundamentally um rooted in us humans is this drive to exploit to 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 enslave and exploit because if it starts where when we think of capitalism officially sort of that's one thing if it starts you know if it's part of in a way in quotes human nature or you you know if it is a drive to that's going to be a lot harder to eradicate and i'm wondering what your thoughts were about it. I mean, it would be wonderful to eradicate it. It would, you know, it would, it would possibly, I want, it would possibly require a rebirth of the human species somehow, of the, you know, of, yes, what it means to be human. And uh, so it feels like a, 
a mammoth task. <laughs> Um, yes, yes. But, it's, but yeah, so I, you know, I, I wondered what your thoughts were. On right. I, I think it's a really, I'm going to be brief because I know we're almost out of time, but I, um, so I don't think that um, the, the drive to, as you put it, the drive to exploit and um, take advantage of others emerged with capitalism. So it's really important to know that our exploitation of other animals and each other happened prior to capitalism. Capitalism wasn't the advent of that. Um, we let now live in a vast advanced racial capital society. So that is something that needs to be addressed and it's not being addressed as much, but it's not an origin story as it were. Um, I also just wanna say again, what I said at the beginning, and it's a really important um, eco-feminist insight, I think, and that is that there isn't one thing that humans are, there isn't one thing that humans do. There have been the majority maybe, or what we pay attention to, the victors are the ones that speak of history. So um, certainly exploitation of women and racialized others and non-human animals and the environment is uh, seems like a long history. Um, but there are traditions and cultures in which that isn't true. And it's important to know that so if that's the case, you can't make a claim about human nature. Um, Jainism, for example, is an amazing religion. Um, it goes back thousands and thousands and thousands of years, and it had the ideology that we ought to, ahimsa, do no harm, you know. Um, so I think that there's ways that we can see historically that there's diversity. There's always diversity in our views. Um, and that's an important insight. And I know it's past time, so I will. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, we're, as you can see, I, we're running out of time and we don't, uh, we couldn't get to all of your questions. Uh, so I wrote my, uh, you can continue the discussion. You can write uh, questions to Laurie and I will pass it on. Uh, thank you so much again, Laurie, for a wonderful talk. And thank you, thank you everyone me. who participated. Uh, please stay with us for the next session of this evening, Ecofeminism, Gender, and Animals, which will start right now. Um, is the conference, can, the conf can you uh, stop the recording from the conference room and then...